Uh, my name is Charles Scott. I work in both music and sound here at uh, Bad Robot in Santa Monica, California. Bad Robot is J.J. Uh, Abrams' uh, production company. Uh, he is, you know, obviously a quite well-known, uh, you know, director, obviously uh, as well as a writer and and, and producer. Um, you know, from most recently Star Wars: The Force Awakens, through the uh, the reboot of Star Trek uh, in 2009, the uh, Cloverfield movies, but also the TV shows like. Uh, Lost and uh, the person of interest and Fringe, uh, and and you know and others. You know, Bad Robot has been a company for getting on close to ten years now. So it's primarily is a production company that you know develops uh, new TV shows and films uh, for our for our part our studio partners, which is you know, Paramount for features and uh, Warner Brothers for television. My job covers things ranging from uh, writing and producing original music to uh, recording sound and voices for our various uh, shows, uh, you know, TV shows, films, and now uh, video games as well. I, I, I sort of from the New York area, um, at one very brief point in my life, went to Berkeley College of Music uh, as a guitar and, uh, you know, music production uh, major, but pretty quickly left to go play in bands. I, I, I wanted to be on, on tour and stuff, and both my parents are musicians, uh, classical and, and Broadway. And yeah, so I, I you know, kind of maybe got more of an education doing that, going out on the road, doing everything from you know, playing as a sideman in bands on guitar and, and keyboards and drums, to being a guitar tech, to mixing front of house, to uh, being a tour manager and driving a U-Haul truck. Um, and then um, just through you know, kind of friends of the family getting to go and hang out at recording studios. There were a couple of great recording studios in sort of suburban New Jersey at the time that did did commercials, but would do jazz records and would have indie bands and stuff. And um, just, you know, kind of basically, you know, being persistent and hanging out there and just trying to pick up what I could and then getting some assistant engineering work that way and really got bit with that bug of, of, of engineering. Um, and that sort of led to a couple of friends and I having uh, a couple of you know, smallish recording studios in Lower Manhattan. This is sort of you know, tail end of the '90s and stuff. When when you could you could have a small recording studio and have, you know, independent label clients, and that was still a business. You know, you could uh, you know really sustain. Got to do a lot of really fun stuff, both on the production and the mixing and the mastering side of things, and st still you know healthy mix of playing. Um, 2005 came out to LA and um, kind of taking a break from music as a full-time thing. Uh, I, I had sort of also been very interested in, in computer graphics and visual effects and was sort of trying that on to see if that was, you know, uh, something I'd like to do as much. And um, through some you know, people I know, knew and had studied with wound up coming to work for, for JJ and Bad Robot, um, you know, sort of in-house kind of... Uh, Art, we had sort of a little budding sort of art department that would do, you know, a range of things, whether it was designing little 3D molded prototypes for like a, a piece of costume to, or, or a, a, you know, a, a, making a 3D model of, of a weapon design that someone from the art department had, or, um, you know, just, just starting to sort of figure out what could we do in our sort of in-house workshop, and um, which kind of led back around to when we you know, JJ had decided to build this facility and was talking about a recording studio that kind of seemed like an opportunity to sort of move back into focusing on, you know, certainly on sound, but but music specifically. And um, when our show Fringe launched, which was, I'm going to blank on the year that that started, he suggested that I, I go work on that as a music supervisor. And I was like, great, what is, what is that job? You know, I I'd, I had a little bit of experience on the other side of it being, you know, working with artists and bands, licensing stuff to productions, but it was it seemed like an, a really cool opportunity to get to do the, the flip side of that and, and you know, um, kind of learn the ropes of, um, well, just how, how music integrates with the production of a show and especially a, especially a network show where you're delivering a lot of episodes in a lot, you know, short period of time and from when you first see the cut of the show to when it goes to the final dub is, you know, is about 10 days and just what the process of you know, f well, finding material that wants to get used and clearing it and 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 all the things that can go wrong last minute and and um, that was it was like a great boot camp. Um, so yeah, so I've been been here since then and 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 you know like a lot of people here, it's it's 
project to project, different things. So it might be music supervision exclusively on a show. It might be a mix of that plus some writing um, or, or uh, you know, producing sort of more soundtrack song type stuff to uh, original score. And it's never, never a dull moment here. You know, I sometimes say I'm like a Swiss Army knife. Obviously, production is relies on a lot of people that can solve problems uh, of all kinds uh, quickly. And and yeah, we think of this our our building as like one big you know toolbox. And and certainly on the on the music side and to some extent on the sound side, it's like what can we do here? And when we're in a we're, especially when we're in a pinch, or like you know, how can we just bring all these tools to bear to make the thing better? Um, I'm still like amazed films ever get finished. Like it seems impossible that that many people can work together on the same thing towards a single goal and like get there, you know, in the time that you have to. And it's, you know, every time it's, it's sort of amazing um, that it gets done. Uh, so, yeah, so within our little mini uh, complex, uh, which is, which is really two buildings that have now sort of merged into one, um, there's this room, which is sort of our, you know, we call it the music room, although we do, stuff other than music here. Um, and there are two screening rooms that that we call them the war room or the war rooms now. Everything sort of has to be multi-purpose. So we have a, you know, a, a big theater next door that is set up for Atmos, both playback and, uh, and, and for mixing as well, that on a given day could be um, you know, configured to do a mix or a playback or um, sound editorial, et cetera. We have a smaller theater here, which was, which was the one that we had first. Uh, which is set up for 7-1 mix, so anything up to 7-1 can mix in there. Um, and uh, again, we can go from theater mode to uh, bringing in a desk and, and do a mix. Uh, we've mixed a couple whole series of shows in, in that smaller theater. It's a great TV mix space. Uh, we mixed the you know uh, trailers for Star Wars in the, in the, in the, in the big room. Um, and then everything's tied to here, so we can, you know have a sort of semi-remote capability. Um, everything from little, little things like recording a table read of you know actors going through a script, we can have everyone in a big comfortable space set up, mic that, and I can roll from down here um, to uh, yeah group uh, ADR sessions that type of thing to um, musical recording. I guess in theory you could have two groups going on the different stages and then track it all through here. In building the space out, there's a lot of thought given to connectivity between the different spaces early on, and that, that sort of applies to the video side as well, but you know, having sort of central storage and then any room could go from being an office to an edit bay or a color suite or a or sound editorial space and still connect to all the shared media um, so that we're, you know, on a different production, you could, you could move people around if you needed to and still accommodate whatever the, the task was. Um, yeah, so in this room, we'll do any number of things. Um, over the last couple of years, on the last couple of shows, a, a lot of ADR has happened here, um, which really began out of convenience. I mean, uh, if JJ or another director that we're working with is uh, cutting in one of our edit bays 20 feet from here, to be able to have um, an actor come in, um, just record here in this sort of more, somewhat more casual environment, the director can kind of come over when they're ready and they can work together and then they can go back to editorial and hear that ADR in context, you know, right away. We started to see some benefit from that. So we've just been doing more and more of that um, over the last couple of years. Um, so certainly on our last few features and, and across our shows. So that's been, um, you know, just a great convenience to have that. Um, it wasn't necessarily the original design of this space. It was designed more as a music you know, writing and composing space, and um, and we do you know a fair amount of that. Whether that's been theme songs that either say JJ's written or things we've written together, to original songs that we've we've produced with artists that we are just people we're friends with that we wanted to you know feature in a in a show or or a film, um, to uh, scoring a new uh, video game that we have in the works. We're doing all the scoring here, so just just at at that desk. Writing, producing, mixing, kind of all in one, you know, thing here. Um, that's that's been been great, and we sort of have you know enough of all the tools that we need in terms of instruments and outboard gear and you know monitoring. So whether it's more on the pure post sound side, 
to purely musical stuff. Um, so I guess going back to 2008, maybe, when we started work on this this building and the, the design of it, um, you know, JJ had indicated wanting to have uh, a recording studio of, of some kind. And, and we sort of had on the blueprint sort of figured out what the footprint was like, okay, we can, we can build something here. What should we do? And then, so we started, um, you know, discussing, well, how much of it does it want to be about recording versus say a place where we can mix versus a place for, uh, you know, writing and, and having maybe other people come in to work with us and, and just trying to get that kind of balance right of um, of what it should be, and it's it's not a it's not a huge space, um, but uh, but we wanted to do it right. So you know everything from just the construction of it to you know really floating the floor, you know having it isolated from the rest of the building, so that we could you know really crank it up in here volume wise. But then someone could be editing you know in a in a, a video edit suite across the hall, something very quiet and not be disturbed, and you know, to also be able to make good quality recordings here of whatever it is we were we were doing. JJ's a musical fan and fanatic and a composer and a piano player. Um, so we also want, you know, we wanted a place where we were like, yeah, we should have all our, our keyboards, our guitars, our, our drums here, everything should be here. It should all be sort of set up and ready to go so that, you know, the one day a year where there's a, a, a lull in the schedule and, you know, he wants to come in and jam on an idea for a theme. He's written several of the theme songs for uh, our shows over the years that that can happen without kind of like, all right, well, let's schedule a time in the studio. Let's plug everything. It's like, have it as ready to go as possible, as well as for post-production. Um, we try to have it set up so that if someone wants to quickly, you know, record some temp line for something, you know, in five minutes, we can switch gears from maybe I'm working on mixing something. Cool, let's do that. And then jump back into it and be flexible. the equipment and the sort of uh, kind of infrastructure design of it, that was sort of my, more my focus. And um, specific to SSL, sort of had always wanted to have an SSL desk in the studio. I'd been to lots of other studios and, and worked on them, but um, it was, I don't know how, how long the AWS had been out at that point, but it was still pretty new to me. Given the physical footprint of this place, it was like, oh yeah, that'll that'll fit. And that has like kind of everything we needed in terms of you know analog, I.O. and E.Q. and pre's and stuff, but also the control surface features. We were you know, just sort of starting to get into that mode of, of, of working. That was sort of the first decision and then sort of building out, you know, from that. And we have a we have a nice machine room that's separate from here. So just designing wiring and conduit and stuff so we could have computers and noisy stuff with fans, you know, in an air conditioned room um, and have it be, you know, as quiet as we need for recording acoustic guitar or really quiet dialogue or something in, in here. You know, right now, most of my time um, is, is kind of spent writing for a few different things. So I'm working on either pieces of score or like song material that I'll be working on with different people. So for that, I mostly do writing in, in Logic. That's sort of my DAW of choice. I will go into Pro Tools for more editorial or post-centric stuff, but that was, um, actually it was JJ that turned me on to it because he was had been working in Logic for a few years. And I think he at one point sent me is right when I had started, sent me some session in Logic, and I was like, I don't, I don't use this program. I got, I best, guess I better, better learn it. Um, I had been using, I think I was like Digital Performer up to that point. Anyway, so taught myself Logic, and then kind of really got to love it, and that's my, my mainstay. So, and so there's 24 I/O on that system that goes to the AWS. Some of that stuff is dedicated, like I/O for like mics and stuff. If I want to track drums and vocals and guitars and stuff. And then a bunch of them I usually leave set up as sort of hardware inserts so I can patch in like distressors, get a lot of use, the Eventide harmonizer, uh, of a Shadow Hills mastering compressor, um, which used for a lot more than mastering, just use that as a, you know, a lot of times it's just two great mono compressors of different flavors and, you know, 1176 and stuff like that. I'm, I'm a guitar player. Uh, at least that's the instrument I can say I sort of play, you know, de decently. Mostly for like to keep myself sane and for fun. Try to like find ways to like, just you know put you know quote like real instruments or things that were played in real time and not quantized. And I'm a terrible piano player, so it's like any hope I have of like infusing some humanity into the music is going to come from playing 
that. So I try to find ways to weave in guitar, even if it's like a textural thing or making you know pads out of guitar sounds. So in the in the live room, I have sort of right now they're all behind baffles, but about eight different amps that are in there that you know can really pull a bunch of different sounds from, and uh, some cool guitars, lots of fun just old, older effects. I'm really into like late '70s into early '80s classic like electro harmonics and MXR pedals and and it sounds that I feel like you still don't quite get from from plugins yet. And I and I love guitar plugins. Like I mean I'm I'm I have like a Kemper profiling amp and I use guitar rig all the time for recording and 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 that stuff's great. But there's like that comp that's still that magical signal chain of like a guitar into like late seventies electric mistress and an MXR compressor into, you know, a fender amp with it's like all those little degrees of imperfection that add up to something that you know brings something else to it. So it's so it's a mix of yeah in the box stuff and plugins and synths and sequencing and then try to sprinkle a healthy dose of you know things that actually came out of a speaker or, or you know were captured by a microphone at some point. <laughs> Beyond, I mean, like you can obviously you can debate the the realism of a of a, say a hardware synthesizer versus the virtualized version of it or whatever. But you know there is a thing about, and it maybe goes back to childhood of like, you know, the first time you touch a new instrument or get to play with a new instrument, it's the the feeling of the possibility that it gives you. Maybe this is a you know being a child of the '70s or whatever of a certain era, what pre pre plug in and sort of pre computer, but like that idea that there's this physical thing that makes music that, um, you know, that you can coax something new out of and, and, and moving from one instrument to another might have a really different impact on how you approach it. And even musicians I know that are much younger and that, you know, got into music through the sequencer, like started, you know, writing music in FL Studio, having never touched a keyboard and just programming stuff on the, you know, in, in the grid and on the piano roll and making really cool stuff still get excited like when you put like you know a mini moog in front of them there's this tactile reaction you know between between the two and there's sort of one knob per function which is again i think why like a console and a physical mixing service um and you know outboard eqs and pre's and stuff that ability to you know use both hands and close your eyes and be affecting the sound versus solely looking at you know a spectrum analyzer and an EQ and drawing a sort of endless possible curves. So the the way it's set up right now, which is probably on on a lot of work days, how I have it um, on the far left, I'll have like you know two or four outputs from DAW as as playback, just kind of like outputs one. And if I'm mixing in the box, I'll only be sending you know two channels to the desk, maybe. I might separately send a click if we're doing uh, overdubs and I want to just sort of have that on a separate set of faders. So that would sort of be far left, you know, just line input straight from the from the interfaces. Um, I might have a couple mics up up next or, or, a, or like, you know, a keyboard. Uh, might have a couple mics uh, r running into the next few channels as well as inputs from a, from a, a keyboard or something. Um, again, if we're working out parts in the studio, have those, you know, kind of live so someone could sit down at the keys and just start banging out an idea um, whether or not the the DAW is ready to record or not, just that it's like, it's always on. I usually kind of have the, the middle of the console set up for, um, for for ADR sessions. If we're doing a remote session, a little talkback mic that we can send to the remote as well as the return from, you know, the remote host, um, which, you know, will get fed to the monitors here, also get fed to, you know, to, to, to phones in, in the booth. And then to the right would uh, be a couple other mics that are, you know, in, in the booth, like, uh, you know, maybe a couple mics on a guitar cabinet, a room mic, maybe another vocal mic. Um, and then I usually have on the far right inputs from a second uh, computer. So whether that's I have another iMac that's running Pro Tools that I might need to, to, to sync up with my main DAW either as a record or someone's got a session in Pro Tools that we want to be able to play back but not interrupt our main thing. Um, so that'll, that'll come up here. Or if I have a, another artist or producer come in that brings a laptop based system, um, I just have a couple, you know, long quarter inch to TT cables that they can quickly patch into the desk and, and then we can listen on the same monitors. 
seventy five percent of the time it, it's running that way, and then I'll you know I will um, you know pop into control surface mode to write some automation uh, for you know for tracks doing doing vocal rides and stuff like that. Um, occasionally, if I'm you know feeling adventurous, pulling up you know plug in parameters and stuff on on the desk um, to just maybe have a different way to experiment when time allows for for doing not a strictly in the box mix. Um, you know, I'll kind of, I'll sort of move to all, all line inputs and, you know, maybe stem out things to, you know, the first eight or 16 inputs on the desk uh, while reserving a few outputs from my DAW for sort of hardware inserts to patch in, you know, compressors and, and, and reverbs and kind of have a couple old, like, uh, you know, roll and delay and stuff that I just like the sound of. That'll usually be a, a hybrid of, you know, going out to, to, to stems, patching in outboard, you know, analog gear, but probably still doing most of the fader moves, you know, in, inside the, the DAW just for, for repeatability. I'm sure that's how a lot of people are, uh, uh, are doing it. Most of the time we'll print mixes, uh, you know, through the bus compressor. Um, even, if I, even if I do like a straight in the box bounce, I'll do, I'll do one uh, through that. And maybe I'll AB, AB that with like, you know, mix that's been run through that with one that's run through stereo distressors, one that's run through shadow hills um, with a couple different settings. So I can quickly then just see like, yeah, which mix fits this piece of music or, you know, uh, better. Sometimes even like blend the two kind of, you know, parallel mixes. Um, the things that, you know, initially I was so excited about, which was the idea of it being uh, a control surface um, for, for what I do day to day became Kind of took a back seat to just um i have like 24 amazing mic pre's and eqs you know the noise floor being so quiet so when we're you know doing you know like a really some kind of super delicate super low volume performance on something having that um that fidelity in a small footprint and having a, so many you know a whole bunch of inputs that way um that it's 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 been the highest fidelity uh workflow in, in, in a small space that, um, that I've ever gotten to work with. And, and pre's and EQs, the, you know, the, the dynamics module, especially the bus compressor, having that just there, um, ha has, has been great. And being able to play back in five one, um, you know, I'm not typically not doing a lot of surround mixing in this room, but to really quickly be able to, to, to do five one playback, um, on, on the console is, is, is great. Like every once in a while, like, do we need a console? Like I go to so many studios and people have like a, you know, like a, like a Mackie big knob and a pair of monitors and then, you know, a couple computer screens and there's no desk. And I'm like, are we like, are we sort of being dinosaurs about this? But I'm like, I can't imagine doing it without, uh, like when I stop to think about it, it's like, oh, well, yeah, I would have to have a whole rack of pre's and all these EQs and how would I patch them together? Whether it's summing, whether it's being able to just throw a few mics on a single sound source and quickly bust them to a single input on my DAW, whether it's, you know, obviously, mo it, you know, basic stuff, but like monitor switching and mono summing and, and, and all that stuff. Um, yeah, it's just like, you know, obviously compared to the bigger desks where it maybe has dynamics on every single channel and stuff, it's like a leaner, it's like a leaner, meaner version of that. But it, I mean, it does, you know, it does everything, you know, we've needed.